In Yu-Gi-Oh, card advantage is one of the most important mechanics in the game. Players will do nearly anything to draw a card on the first turn just to improve their consistency or dig for their most powerful cards. But what about the Yu-Gi-Oh cards that actually lose you card advantage when you activate them? What does it take for a card that undermines Yu-Gi-Oh's most important mechanic to be good? Today, we'll be going over the 10 best cards that make you go minus one, or worse, when you use them. So let's get started. And kicking off this list at number 10, we have Signet Mining. This spell card states that you send one card from your hand to the graveyard, then add any level 4 or lower Cybers monster from your deck to your hand and you can only use this effect once per turn. Signet Mining is one of the best examples of an incredible consistency card that loses you card advantage most of the time. Basically, any Cybers heavy deck can justify running three copies of Signet Mining because having three more functional copies of all of your Cyber spawns in your deck is usually worth losing that one card. Monsters like Salamagrate Gazelle and Mathmech Circular are critical combo starters in their respective archetypes and are both limited to one copy currently in the TCG. And they're so centralized and powerful to the respective archetypes that any way to get more functional ways to draw them in your opening hand is usually worth it. Despite Signet Mining comparing unfavorably to other generic monster type searcher cards like Fire Formation Tenki or Reinforcements of the Army, the cost to send a card to the graveyard isn't even always bad. For instance, in both our previous archetype examples of Mathmec and Salomon Great, they have cards that the decks do not mind putting into the graveyard like Salmon Great Spinny and Math Mech Sigma. Both these cards can special summon themselves for free in the graveyard, so Sign Up Mining can both search your best starter and set up an extender at the same time, despite technically losing you a card in the process. A super important thing about any minus one card like Sign Up Mining is that the power of the card you're losing card advantage to search can, in some way, make up for that advantage. Circular, for instance, can immediately replace the card you're discarding with its own effect to search a Math Mech Spell or Trap card like Math Mech Super Factorial or Math Mech Equation to make the card disadvantage from searching it with Signet Mining suddenly not matter. Gazelle can send a Spinny for a free special summon to make up for the value or even send a Trap card like Salmigrate Roar that can set itself once you start doing your basic Salmigrate Link Plays, getting you a powerful piece of interaction to make up for the card you just discarded. There are more Cyber decks that love running Signet Mining just for that consistency like Ignisters, Co-Talkers, or basically every major Cyber Sark type printed so far. So long as your Cybers deck really appreciates access to specific monsters, it's likely running Signet Mining in spite of the hefty cost. Next up at number 9 on this list, we have Small World. This card's effect lets you reveal and banish a monster face down from your hand, then you search your deck for a monster that shares only a single quality with the monster revealed, meaning it needs the exact same attack, defense, level, attribute, or creature type but it must only be identical in exactly one of those stats. You then banish the revealed monster in your deck face down and reveal a third monster, repeating the process between the second card you revealed and this third monster. Then you get to add that third monster to your hand. Small World is one of the most complicated and interesting cards in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, which is saying a lot given how absurd some Yu-Gi-Oh text boxes can be. The basic requirement of Small World is your deck needs to have a roster of monsters that often share one quality, but don't always share multiple similarities. As an example of a current meta deck that isn't great with Small World, Cash Tira has most of its main monsters sharing both the level 7 distinction and the psychic monster type, on top of already having good monster searching capabilities with cards like Pressure Planet Wraithsoth, Cash Tira Theosis, and Cash Tira Fenrir. Small World is at its best in a deck that really needs to find a specific card and often lacks search options. So a deck like the previously mentioned Math Mech loves Small World. The deck is centralized around Math Mech Circular and lacks any search effects besides the aforementioned Signet Mining, since Math Mechs themselves have their certain capabilities locked behind an extra deck monster like Prime Math Mech Alembertian. And as mentioned earlier, Circular is so powerful that it can make up for the inherent minus one that a card that might search it entails, which is a big deal, as unlike Signet Mining, Small World's Banished face down to resolve its search means there's basically no value you can get out of its cost, unlike Signet Mining's graveyard synergies. So despite being a more concrete card advantage minus and being awkward to fit in many decks, why does Small World get a spot over Signet Mining? That would be because of the incredible versatility Small World is capable of. Small World is the only completely generic card in Yu-Gi-Oh that can, with enough effort and deck building discipline, search literally any monster in the game. This lets you functionally include non-archetype searching to any deck, which makes combining and crossing over engines and archetypes a possibility with Small World holding them together. Small World is a relatively new and very difficult to master and implement card, so it hasn't seen a ton of play outside of the very straightforward Mathmic builds. But the interesting thing about Small World is that with every new release, the card gets more and more powerful. As Yugu continues to release new and more powerful cards and expand the pool of monsters to include a larger variety of card combinations for Small World to connect, Small World only gets better. It has the potential to be the most versatile card in the game. Need to search a kaiju? Small World can do that. 
need to search a specific hand trap because you know their deck you're going against struggles against it? Small World can do that. Do you have a powerful card your deck can't otherwise search but you still need access to? Well, guess what? Small World can do it. Small World doubles as a consistency boost and combo enabler as well as a toolbox card, functionally increasing the copies of every monster in your deck by three without screwing up your deck size. Of almost all of the cards in this list, Small World has the highest potential to completely leapfrog this ranking given enough time. But for now, we'll keep it safely at number 9 until someone, someday, eventually breaks this incredibly unique card. Next up at number 8, we have Foolish Burial. This is a spell card that simply states that you send one monster from your deck to the graveyard. When it comes to a minus 1 with nearly infinite utility, Foolish Burial is one of the best examples in the game. There are hundreds of powerful effects of monsters that either trigger when sent to the graveyard or can be activated from the graveyard. Sometimes it's as simple as a card like Blackwing Zephros the Elite, who can special summon itself with a very easy to fulfill condition of bouncing a card from your field back to your hand. On its own, that turns Foolish Burial's inherent minus one in card advantage into a net neutral and a free special summon from the graveyard. If you pair it with bouncing a card that you can extract more value from, like a danger monster, or a continuous field spell card that can use multiple times per turn, you can even go plus in card advantage off of Zephros, and that's just one example. For many decks, archetypes, and engines, Foolish Burial is a key consistency piece for them. The Adventure Engine famously can use the effect of Water Enchanters of the Temple from the graveyard to immediately add a Rite of Aramisir to the hand. A card that, on its own, can get you two monsters and two spells in the field at no further cost, being a technical plus three in total advantage. This is maybe the best case scenario from a card advantage perspective for Foolish Burial. Sometimes it can set up interaction, as in the past, sending a card like Fairy Tale Snow meant not only a free level 4 special summon for all sorts of combos, but a free, quick effect Book of Moon style interaction on your opponent's turn if you could fill your graveyard up enough after the Foolish Burial, though Snow would earn itself a ban for being too powerful when sent to the graveyard for that very reason. Most recently, a deck like Tierlaments could just send any of the main deck Tierlament monsters to immediately set up their first fusion. Some decks could even run Foolish Burial as a utility effect removal, as Ad Emancipators would frequently run Tackle Crusader as an accessible engine piece in their rock-centric toolbox, but also ran Foolish Burial for other reasons. Incidentally, having these two cards together in the same deck turned Foolish Burial from a combo piece to a utility removal card for troublesome spells and traps like Floodgates that the deck would struggle to deal with otherwise thanks to Tackle Crusader bouncing spell traps and sent to the graveyard. Or it could even flip troublesome monsters face down. Even when Foolish Burial isn't immediately working as a utility or recouping the card advantage it loses you, it's still a great card. Some decks just need particular monsters in the graveyard to get their plays going, and anything that can do that is good enough. Foolish Burial is a classic example of cards that flips the concept of card advantage being paramount on its head. It seems bad at first, but once you examine how modern decks function, it really is stupendously good as a card that almost always offsets the lack of card advantage in one way or another. And at number 7 on our list, we have 1 for 1. This is a spell card which states you discard a monster from your hand, then special summon a level 1 monster from your deck. Much like Foolish Burial, 1 for 1 is a very simple card with an absurdly powerful effect. Generically, summoning any level 1 monster from your deck has a lot of different abuse cases. While the restriction to just level 1 monsters might make it seem unexciting, some of Yu-Gi-Oh's most powerful monsters, historically, were weak statted level 1 monsters with incredible effects. The most obvious one would be Magical Scientist, but it was long banned before 1 for 1 was legal. The first deck to really use 1 for 1 to its full potential was Infernity. The inherent negative 1 in card advantage in hand was actually an upside in most cases with the unusual gimmick of Infernity, as they needed to have their hand empty to really pull off their most powerful combos. Considering the deck also loved to get Infernity Mirage on the field for free, that minus one from one for one could quickly turn into going even, thanks to Infernity Mirage, tribute itself to special summon two other Infernity monsters from the graveyard. And that's really the premise behind one for one. Just like with the previous cards on this list, the card you're accessing off of one for one can and should make up for any card disadvantage. It does help that one for one can also put a monster you want in the graveyard there with its discard effect. For instance, frog decks ranging across multiple years and formats would love to discard most of their frog names to give fuel for Ronin Toten, or just put Ronin Toten in the graveyard regardless if you drew it alongside one for one. Special Summon out Sepsitoad, one of the strongest main deck monsters ever, was the best thing you could be doing in many formats. That said, Sepsitoad still needed another monster in the field to get your typical frog combos going, and one for one was ideal in this scenario, as it saved your normal summon to get Sepsitoad going while accessing this broken monster. Maybe the best singular one-for-one -one target ever was Spiral Quick Fix. While many of these previously mentioned cards were powerful when special summoned, they often still needed further follow-up to do something. Quick Fix would immediately enable a full combo in Spiral thanks to its ability to search its fellow level 1 monster in Spiral Gear Drone. A normal summon off a drone would ensure a successful Spiral Double Helix activation once you link the two off, which is a powerful enough outcome on its own. 
but even after that you still have a quick fixes graveyard effect to continue extending the combo, giving you potential further searches and special summons on top of that. Several different archetypes have power level 1 monsters that look in access, whether it's Cosmo looking for a free tin can, or Infernoids looking for a copy of Decatron. Some decks wouldn't even use 1 for 1 as its archetypal access, as before its banning, Glowa Bulb was one of the absolute best synchro enablers ever printed, and its effect is special summon itself from the graveyard for no real cost, but inherently replace the card you lost in 1 for 1. So even decks that were just splashing Glow Up Bulb would often play this card as a more powerful, but more costly way to access it. Even as recently as the current format, Rescue Ace have just come out with their main starter, Rescue Ace Hydrant, a level 1 monster that loves to be special summon. 1 for 1 has an incredibly long history of being a high power level card, and it's so good it can't really exist in multiples as some decks could exploit it too much. So long as power level 1 monsters exist and continue to get printed, expect to see 1 for 1 as a mainstay at Yu-Gi-Oh for as long as it exists. And taking number 6 on this list, we have Tier Limit Shiren. This is a level 4 Dark Aqua monster with 1800 attack. Shiren has two effects. The card's first is you can special summon Shiren from your hand, sending another monster from your hand to the graveyard, and then sending three cards on top of your deck to the graveyard. The second effect is if Shiren is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can perform a fusion summon using Shiren to the graveyard as a material, along with any monsters in your hand, field, or graveyard, by placing all those materials on the bottom of your deck. Shiren is one of the more powerful starters in the tier element archetype, arguably the most powerful archetype in the most powerful deck in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. And it's in no small part to do to Shiren. Tier elements in general revolve around sending cards to the graveyard, usually by milling cards from the deck to trigger effects like Shiren's secondary effect to create powerful fusion monsters. As mentioned previously with Foolish Burial and other cards, many decks can benefit from putting certain cards into the graveyard, and Tier Limits is almost certainly the best example of that. Shiren works both as the archetype's best extender as well as its second best starter in the main deck, with only Tier Limits Rhino Heart being a better starter, usually. Shiren does cost you a card to special summon, fulfilling the inherent minus one nature of the card, but generally, in a Tier Limits deck, the three random mills that Shiren creates with her effect is going to be worth the card you lost. If you mill another Tier Limits main deck monster like Merely or Havness, either one of those and Shiren herself on the field will fulfill the conditions for you to fusion summon Tier Limits Kid Kalos, a ban-worthy fusion monster that can create an unbelievable amount of value on her own. And most of the Tier Limits spell and trap cards, like Tier Limits Suliac and Tier Limits Scream, let you search for your deck from the other Tier Limit cards when they get sent to the graveyard by card effects like Shiren. Not only that, Shiren's effect to special summon her by pitching a monster from your hand is not treated as a cost. This means that if the card you're sending to the graveyard from hand has an effect that activates when sent by a card effect, like the main deck Tillman monsters, Shiren's effect will trigger them. So Shiren, another Tillman's monster, is a guaranteed Kid Kalos in those scenarios. Shiren is also very important to the deck because of her level. As a very heavily graveyard-based deck, the most obvious weakness is cards that lock out the graveyard. So cards like Abyss Dweller, Dimension Shifter, Backward Cosmos, the usual anti-graveyard suspects. Shiren's ability to be a free level 4 special summon in basically any hand, alongside other copies of Shiren or Rhino Heart as normal summons, means Tier Limits has easy access to the incredibly powerful Rank 4 toolbox. This gave Tier Limits ways to answer anti-graveyard floodgates thanks to Rank 4 access to very powerful backup plans like Baguska, or just any Rank 4 to gain access to Zeus who could answer the floodgates. It also let the deck access Time Thief Redoer, who could detach Shiren for effect on your opponent's turn, triggering her fusion effect. Shiren is such a great rank 4 enabler that she alone bridges synergy gaps for rank 4 archetypes and tier limits, like how the deck was ran with Lunalite, or more famously, the Ashizu monsters, who themselves were a great rank 4 engine and synergized perfectly with tier limits. Despite tier limits being hit hard enough on the ban list to no longer be the dominant tier force it once was, Shiren is perhaps the best main deck monster in the history of the game that makes you ditch another monster from your hand just to summon it. Taking number 5 spot on this list, we have the Nightmares, with Nightmare Unicorn leading the pack as the most played one, and Nightmare Goblin being the most overpowered member of the group. The Nightmares are a series of link monsters that each share a common quality. When you link some of them, you discard a card and get an effect. Ignoring the inherent lack of card advantage that going into an extra deck play like Link Summoning technically creates, the majority of the Nightmares frequently lose you card advantage when activating their effects. Though, technically, both Nightmare Griffin and Nightmare Mermaid are excluded from this distinction, as they both instantly replace the card you discard. The core three removal nightmares, Cerberus, Phoenix, and Unicorn, have been some of the best generic extra deck staples ever since they were printed. Each one provides a powerful removal effect in exchange for a discarded card, with Cerberus destroying a special summon monster in your opponent's main monster zones, Phoenix destroying a spell or trap, and Unicorn shuffling a card in the field into its owner's deck. An interesting note about the Nightmares is that they aren't technically always a minus of one in your personal card count, as if they are co-linked when you summon them, you do get to draw a card to replace the card you're discarding. This is a very useful effect, but doesn't really come up a lot outside of incredibly link-centric decks. 
Most of the time, when you summon these cards, you'll just end with one less card in your hand before activating their effects. That said, they are removal. Taking out a card your opponent controls often equalizes the relative card advantage between you and them, though not always. For instance, Nightmare Phoenix is great for removing back row, but if your opponent has a chainable set like, for instance, a compulsory evacuation device, they might just be able to remove your monster despite you discarding to try to make an even trade. But even in those negative trade scenarios, forcing out your opponent's interaction can often free up your own plays for your more crucial combos. Speaking of combos, the most obvious minus one of the crew is Nightmare Goblin. While Nightmare Goblin can also co-link to replace the card, if you don't, it's not even removing an opponent's card to make up for it. Instead, Goblin just provides you with an extra normal summon. It's hard to say just how truly powerful this effect is, especially out of the extra deck for generic monsters. The single normal summon per turn is one of the only truly limited resources you have as Yu-Gi-Oh player, and a generic Link 2 bypassing that at the cost of a single discard is just not worth it. It breaks a plethora of decks wide open. Double Summon, a comparable card, has seen some play in the past, but isn't really playable because it's a bad draw if the rest of your hand doesn't work with it. If Nightmare Goblin's Extra Normal Summon isn't crucial to you, you just don't have to summon it and it doesn't clog up your hand. The card is incredibly broken and banned for good reason. If it weren't for the fact that Goblin is banned, it would likely be the most played Nightmare instead of Unicorn for just how powerful a free normal summon can be despite Unicorn's own effect being one of the best forms of extra deck removal available in the game. The Nightmares as a whole just show how flexible the concept of card advantage can be, each being a staple in the modern game, or in many cases, banned powerhouses. And taking number four spot on this list, we have Forbidden Droplet. This is a quick play spell that lets you send cards from your hand or field to the graveyard as cost, and for each card you send, you can negate the effects of one effect monster on your opponent's side of the field, as well as have their attack points until the end of the turn. Also, for each different card type amongst monsters, spells, and traps your opponent sends for cost for the effect, your opponent cannot respond to Forbidden Droplet with that type of card. So, theoretically, if you send a monster and spell card off of Forbidden Droplet, the only card type your opponent could chain to Droplet would be a trap card. Forbidden Droplet is one of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s premier board-breaking tools. As the Yu-Gi-Oh! card pull throughout the years has increased, more and more powerful boss monsters and archetypes have defined the metagame and they can be hard to deal with without the right cards. An opponent with a board full of monsters sporting negation effects can be a daunting thing to look at, as those effects are usually really strong against traditional board breakers like Raigeki or Lightning Storm, usually only forcing one interaction instead of clearing them away like you would hope. And that's where Forbidden Droplet makes its name known. Thanks to its ability to prevent your opponent from chaining to it if you send the right card, Droplet can very easily send a monster card to the graveyard as well as many more cards, and suddenly all your opponent's big scary boss monsters can't use their effects and are going to be negated. That's not all that's going for Droplet though. Its effect doesn't target, so the fairly common boss monster protection against targeted effects doesn't save them from Droplet. The biggest downside of Droplet is, obviously, that you have to ditch a bunch of your own cards to even use the effect. This is where the minuses come in. Even on its own, you're losing one card to only temporarily negate the monsters on the field instead of answering them. Not to mention the card you're sending to the graveyard. Sometimes you can use Droplet's quick play capabilities to lessen the cost. If you open your turn with an effect that you know your opponent has to negate, like a powerful spell card, you can wait for your opponent to attempt to negate the card, then chain droplet while your spell is still on the field during the chain. This lets you send the card that was already about to hit the graveyard one way or another, letting you recoup a card's worth of value. And if the card wasn't super important, you can also just ignore the monster that already uses negation and hit everything else, since most boss monsters like that are usually limited only using their effects once per turn. Droplet has an insane amount of versatility. So long as you can either combo out of the graveyard from the cards you send off a droplet, or you can negate away everything relevant your opponent has left and then still have some combo starters available to control of the game. It being a quick play spell even lets you use it going second, since it has a backup piece of interaction on top of your usual board. Being outstanding going second and still powerful going first is maybe droplet's best selling points against most other spell and trap based going second cards like Evenly Matched or Dark Ruler No More. Powerful board breakers in their own right, but nearly pointless if you're going first. Its only real downside as a card outside of the huge investment to resolve it is that it has an incredibly hard to play around continuous effect that banishes cards instead of sending them to the graveyard. Continuous effects like Macrocosmos or Cash Tira Rise Heart functionally shut off Droplet as you can't fulfill the condition of sending cards to the graveyard for its cost. It's also worth noting that a lot of decks aren't on a lot of main deck trap cards, so if your opponent's core strategy involves a lot of counter traps, those can often stop a Forbidden Droplet, as you won't have a trap to send to prevent them from chaining a Droplet. Still, Droplet's capability to completely answer a powerful board state without your opponent being able to respond makes it one of the best cards ever, even if at a hefty cost. And speaking of which... Taking the number 3 spot on this list, we have Super Polymerization. 
This is a quick play spell that states you must discard a card, then fusion summon a monster from your deck using monsters on either field as materials. Neither player can activate any cards or effects in response to Super Polarization's activation. Super Poly is perhaps the greatest board breaker in the history of the game. It's very similar to Forbidden Droplet and likely inspired Forbidden Droplet's own effects with how it works. Super Polymerization is often used to fuse away two monsters on your opponent's side of the board to fusion some monsters with very generic materials, like Garuro, Wings of Resident Life, or Mud Dragon of the Swamp. With the heavily archetype-centric way Yu-Gi-Oh decks have become, cards in your opponent's board often share qualities like attributes or types that let you fuse away two of your opponent's monsters and none of yours. Take some modern boss monsters like Appalooza or Baron de Flore. These are both some of the most easily accessible boss monsters that an absurd number of decks can consistently make due to the generic nature of their summoning requirements. They're frequently seen on boards together. They're both wind monsters, but Appalooza is a fairy and Barone is a warrior. And that is the correct fusion requirements for Madragon of the Swamp. Garura usually works very well at enabling super polarization against decks that stick to their own cards. For instance, a deck like Dragon League is likely to end on Borlode Savage Dragon and Borland Dragon, two dark monsters that are easy to make with the various dragon and dark locks that crop into the deck's combo. Despite Borland being incredibly hard to deal with and Savage having an Omni Negate, Super Polarization can turn these two menacing monstrosities into a harmless Garura on your side of the board. And all you have to do is to give up a single card from your hand as a discard. It's not just about fusing away two monsters all the time, too. A fusion based deck like Branded can use a copy of Fallen of Albaz in combination with Super Polarization to basically answer any single extra deck monster, fusing away both into Mirror J, the Ice Blade Dragon. The card is usually restricted only by its requirement to Fallen of Albaz as a material but it's other materials any fusion, XC, synchro, or link monster, which includes the vast majority of powerful boss monsters players tend to play. Much like Forbidden Droplet, its quick play nature is also incredibly useful. It makes it an incredibly hard to play around piece of interaction on your opponent's turn if you draw into it going first and set it. And just like Droplet, you can chain in the middle of your opponent's interactions to really mess up their sequencing. It does have some downsides though. Decks can often build their boards in such a way that the most common super polarization options like Garura and Mud Dragon aren't going to work to clear off two monsters. Some decks just end on one incredibly powerful monster like how Purely has Expirely Noir, meaning short of that previously mentioned Albaz style play, you'll need to provide your own monsters and materials to even potentially make super poly work. That said, in those scenarios, if you can pull it off, your opponent frequently lacks any more interaction as they were too heavily reliant on that one monster. More importantly though, is the extra deck requirement. One to two extra deck slots to effectively use super polarization is a hefty investment. Some decks just can't give up their extra deck slots for a card they're only going to see about one in three games, no matter how powerful. And of course, you do have to discard a card. This isn't as big a cost as Forbidden Droplet is, which is a big reason why super polarization gets the nod and just edges out Droplet on this list, despite being incredibly similar cards in form and function. Next up at number two, we have Hand Traps. Picking one specifically, it would be Ash Blossom and Joy of Spring as the most versatile one. From Ash to Infinite Impermanence to Drone Lockbird, there are a whole slew of powerful hand traps that technically minus one you. The concept of a hand trap is, frequently, you discard them and activate them from your hand to somehow interact with your opponent's plays. Oftentimes with hand traps, the personal card advantage will go down. If your opponent activates a reinforcement of the army and you throw an Ash Blossom and Joy Spring at the effect, you go down from 5 cards in hand to 4. That said, your opponent in this example also loses that reinforcement of the army, so in the larger card advantage situation, you functionally went even. But, for example, if your opponent normal summons a monster that adds a card from their deck, using a card like Infinite Impermanence will leave you with 4 cards and your opponent still has 5 total cards. If you didn't activate your hand trap, they would still get to add the card from their deck to their hand and be at 6 to your 5, so you're losing out on an advantage either way. But with no hand trap, suddenly your opponent can continue their combo, searching a powerful card, which will plus them far beyond any single small card disparity, while usually building them a powerful board you'll have to deal with. This is the fundamental point of hand traps. If you can't interact with your opponent on their first turn, you are going to let them go wild with whatever crazy effects and combos they can pull off. Sometimes sacrificing card advantage to stop their plays can stop them from continuing the combo if you use your hand trap in the right place. While you might be down a card in the exchange, stopping this critical card from resolving for a player can oftentimes completely shut them down, which is well worth one card and can get you a second turn, where you use your own deck's capabilities to do the same, testing your opponents for interaction and turning your lower card count into more powerful options. This kind of preventative gameplay is most represented in the Floodgate style hand traps like Dimension Shifter, Drone Lockbird, Artifact Lancia, and other similar hand traps. These cards are almost always a minus one no matter the situation. They aren't ever really trading for a card on their own, but they unilaterally stop your opponent from performing certain game actions that their deck might rely on to play. Not all hand traps necessarily minus you though, after all, some hand traps like Scythe from Gear Gamma or Ghost of Grinstone Rabbit actually destroy the card they're interacting with, 
Going even, just like in the Ash versus Reinforcement of the Army situation. Or a card like Nibiru the Primal Bean, which can remove a lot of monsters on your opponent's side of the field in Resolution. These cards often avoid the minus card advantage distinction, so not every hand trap would fit in this category. But even the lowly DD Crow, a card that's a minus one for you to merely remove a single card from your opponent's graveyard, has found itself in thousands of decks throughout the years for the utility to shut down certain decks that rely on graveyard interactions to function. Hand traps have been a core part of Yu-Gi-Oh's gameplay for a long time, and the majority of them are almost always a negative in card advantage, but are a huge positive in how they affect the game state and your ability to win. They're critical to the way the game is currently played, despite usually leaving you with less cards to work with. And finally, as the uncontested best minusing card of all time, we have That Grass Looks Greener. This is a spell card that simply states you send the top cards of your deck to the graveyard until your deck gets the same amount of cards as your opponent. So, if you have 40 cards left in your deck and your opponent has 35, you would send 5 cards to the top of your deck to the graveyard so you both have 35. You can only activate that grass looks greener if you have more cards in your deck than your opponent. We've talked about grass quite a few times in this channel. It is very comparable to another card on this list, Foolish Burial. Both cards technically resolve with you at one less card in your hand, and technically nothing to show for it on the field. Foolish Burial has the advantage of selection. You know what you're sending, so unless your opponent interacts with you in some way, you are likely always recouping the cost of it. Otherwise, you're unlikely to run it in your deck, and that's where the advantages really end. That Grass Looks Greener is maybe the most format warping card in the history of the game. It's obviously obscenely powerful. Typically, Yu-Gi-Oh players like to play as close to 40 cards as possible to increase your odds of drawing your best cards. Grass warps deck building to the point where playing 60 cards is potentially optimal just for the chance of being able to resolve a single huge grass mill. If your opponent is on a more disciplined 40 card list and you're on 60, then Grass will mill 20 out of your remaining 55 cards in the deck, also accounting for opening hand draws. A resolved that Grass looks greener has the highest potential of basically any card in the game. Decks that specialize in graveyard synergies love this card. Lightsworn, Zombies, Paleozoics, and tons of other decks and archetypes have all sorts of graveyard synergies and could play a high density of cards that will instantly gain you a ton of value and build off of cards like Grass. Just to get up to 60 cards, players would often cram multiple R-types together, so as long as they had synergies with this effect. A good grass mill is usually upwards of a plus 10 in real advantage, and even a bad one in decks that ran it was still often a plus 4 or plus 5. These decks had so much potential power that, funnily enough, it was sometimes better for everyone to be running 60 cards. And while you might think this would make grass weaker, the card was still insanely strong. These decks would run other cards to help mill synergistic cards out of their deck, like Charge of the Light Brigade or Minerva the Exalted Lightsworn to execute the deck strategy without grass, which would in turn make a grass in the second player's hand suddenly live, functionally as powerful as every single mill effect the first player used combined. Grass is so powerful, it's one of the few spells in the Yu-Gi-Oh's history that is worth not just minusing yourself one for, but minusing yourself three or more for, as it was frequently played alongside Left Arm Offering, a card that requires you to banish your entire hand with a minimum of two other cards to add a spell from your deck to your hand. For most cards, this is certainly not worth it. Few spells are worth scrapping three other cards, but Grass was so powerful it didn't matter. A Resolved Grass was better than an entire hand's worth of cards, and Left Arm Offering meant you could see it in your opening hand twice as often. Grass redefined the concept of deck building, graveyard value, and completely shattered the entire premise of card advantage in multiple ways. It's one of the most influential card in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and is banned for its ability to warp formats in crazy ways. It's no wonder this quote-unquote minus one is so feared. And for that, it easily takes the top spot on this list for the best cards that minus you. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any the cards that minus you that Jim may have missed, or do you have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, please let us know down in the comments below.